It was said that in a little German village, during the 30s, people had their own idea of what National Socialism was. Nazism, they thought, had something to do with purity. Indeed, they even believed its most important feature to be sexual denial. And when the old women talked of this stringent demand, they would shake their troubled heads and say, this National Socialism is a tough one. It's only the teacher who might manage it, or maybe the barber. Even though the villagers had their own idea about Nazism, they nevertheless touched on something important. Nazism's dream of creating, through purity and sacrifice, a more beautiful world. The Nazi gospel warns of a world about to collapse, an eternal twilight that threatens to engulf the earth. The Nazis claim to have discovered the source of this threat and took it upon themselves to eradicate it. Purified and preserved from decay, a new Germany would arise, mightier and more beautiful than ever before. His artistic efforts extended into the 1920s. Pedantically drawn watercolors in the style of postcards. Oh, how I'd love to stay here working with art, he declares from his retreat shortly before war breaks out. He's an artist, not a politician. And as soon as the war is over, he will retire and devote himself to art. At 18, Hitler had unsuccessfully applied to the Academy of Art in Vienna. Refusal was a hard blow, but he hid his disappointment. Instead of returning to his home in Linz, he remained in Vienna. He drifts around Vienna, goes to the opera, paints a little, 
Occasionally, he devotes himself to some far-fetched artistic project. He and his childhood friend, August Kubitschek, make an amateurish effort based on an idea that Richard Wagner abandoned to write an opera together. Three years earlier, he and Kubitschek have had a decisive opera experience. And at the theater in Linz, they have seen Wagner's opera, Rienzi. The opera is set in medieval Rome. Rienzi, the people's spokesman, rises against the aristocracy. He wants to turn the clock back 15 centuries and re-establish the Roman Republic of Antiquity. In that spirit, he lets himself be made tribune of the people. But Rienzi falls victim to a conspiracy. He fights his last battle in the capital as it crashes, burning around him. Hitler is deeply moved by Rienzi. Overwhelmed, he outlines for Kubitschek his plans for his own future and that of his people. Later he would say, it was in that hour it all began. This experience cemented three fixations in Hitler that would never lose their grip on him. His fixations on Linz, his home city, on antiquity, and on Wagner. Whoever would understand Nazism must first know Wagner, said Hitler. And indeed, Wagner occupied a special place in Hitler's imagination. Wagner's political tracks were early favorites of Hitler's. Already in Linz, he had fantasized over his own operas. So extravagant as to eclipse Wagner's works. It was opera's scenic possibilities that fascinated Hitler. The fantastic illusion, the flight from reality. In Wagner, he saw his idol. Creative artist and politician in one person. Hitler borrowed Wagner's props, anti-Semitism, the cult of a Nordic legacy, the myth of pure blood, all gave counter to Hitler's worldview. From Wagner, too, came the notions of art as the basis of a new civilization. And the artist prince, risen from the people, who would unite life and art to herald the advent of the new state. Hitler found use for his artistic bent in political work. He created Nazi props, everything, from uniforms to flags and standards. With his own sketches and instructions, he gave the Nazi movement its form. Hitler's 1923 sketch of the party standard The goldsmith Gar prepares from Hitler's sketches the first standard of the NSDAP. Propaganda provided the outlet for Hitler's artistic ambitions. The Nazi mass rallies were quasi-art of gigantic proportions with Hitler as set designer, director, and leading actor. rallies also embodied a central Nazi ideal, the myth of the body of the German folk. This myth, 
the people, the masses seen as one body with its own circulatory system would become a basic element in the Nazi vision of racial purification. of January 1933. The Nazis celebrate Hitler's seizure of power. Feverish activity is begun to quickly gain control over every level of German society. Everywhere Nazi activists force their way in. A proclamation is made in March. What German artists expect of the new government. The paper's source is a coalition of Nazi cultural groups. Their program demands that Bolshevik unart and unculture be destroyed and they offer at the same time to stand like seasoned soldiers in the vanguard of the struggle. They also demand that all purged works be shown publicly and then burnt as a warning to all. In 1933, a wave of exhibitions of so-called degenerate art washes over Germany. Mannheim, Nuremberg, Dessau, Stuttgart, Dresden. Already in the early 20s, art was of first-rank importance to the Nazis. Cultural degeneration was seen by many as a genuine threat. Decay was a modish word among the German petty bourgeoisie. Behind the calamities that had plagued Germany, cultural Bolshevism in particular, the Jew was felt to be the instigator, the ringleader. with its skewed perspectives of avant-garde art, was to the Nazi an augury of impending doom. To them, the chaos they perceived in it was visible evidence of spiritual and intellectual depravity. In 1928, under the leadership of Rosenberg, the first Nazi cultural organization was founded. The National Socialist Society for German Culture. One of the six founders is SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Later, the society renames itself the Defense Guild for German Culture. The offensive against modern art soon took on a hygienic character. Modern artists' works were said to show signs of mental illness. Their creators were ripe for the madhouse. One of the Defense Guild's most influential members, art theorist Paul Schultz Domberg, begins a nationwide speaking tour in January 1931. In the world of German art, a struggle to the death rages, not unlike the struggle in politics. And it must be fought with the same gravity and singleness of mind, he says. Showing lantern slides to illustrate the lectures, he projects his vision of art hygiene. By choosing pictures of deformed cases from medical journals and comparing them with modern art, he claims to show a link between physical degeneration and artistic perversion. The pictures and diagnoses 
are supplied to him by Dr. Weygandt of Hamburg University Psychiatric Clinic. In Schultz Naumberg's view, art is not only a mirror of racial health. Here he refers to antiquity and the Renaissance, but has as its duty, even as the Grecian marbles did, to be a representative expression of the people's longing for racial fulfillment. On seeing these pictures, no one can identify them with anything but the misshapen wretches in clinics and madhouses, where the blighted and degenerate of our species are gathered, concludes Schultz Naumberg. No spiritually healthy person needs to be convinced that an outlook is revealed here, which must be forever banished from the new Germany. On July 14, 1933, a new law is enacted. This law will help the sick to be healed. It is also important that the healthy and strong are healed. It permits mandatory sterilization of the insane, the asocial, and the hereditarily tainted. But this law is only the first step in an ongoing process. In March 1935, an exhibition opens in Berlin, The Miracle of Life, here, the physician emerges as the spearhead of Nazi racial policy. In the quest for pure blood, the enemies are the Jew, race mixing, and degeneration. In a special section, Schultz Naumberg's comparisons turn up. Another section is devoted to the mentally ill and asocial. A grisly vision is conjured up of idiots and retards gradually outnumbering normal people. Still other sections deal with race, preservation, and refinement. Our first principle of beauty is health, Hitler declares. The methods of medical science will ensure that end. With the physician as esthetician, aesthetic problems became medical ones. This exhibition already defines the presumptions underlying mass murder. No longer does the physician minister to the individual. Now he is the healer of the corpus of the race, a biological warrior fighting diseased and inferior elements that threaten the body of the German folk. Now the physician in uniform comes to the fore of society. The Nazification of physicians began in the first months of Nazi rule, as Jewish doctors were stripped of their positions. This mass expulsion created undreamt of career possibilities. Physicians with the right ideology quickly soared to the top. Special schools offered courses in Nazi medicine. No other profession could boast so many party members. 45% of German physicians belonged to the party. Mein Kampf clearly states the goal of Nazism's biomedical pioneers. A state which preserves in a time of pollution its finest racial elements must one day be lord of the earth. 
Our followers must never forget this when they compare the sacrifices to the envisioned results. Gerhard Wagner, the Third Reich's chief doctor, promises that in the future, too, we shall fulfill our mission according to the Führer's will, to create the new German man. At the National Party rally in 1935, Hitler tells Wagner his intention, to have the incurably ill liquidated. Was wir uns unter der deutschen Jugend der Zukunft wünschen, ist etwas anderes, als was die Vergangenheit sich gewünscht hat. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen nehmen, auf das unser Volk nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit Runde geht. During this rally, new laws are made public, which Gerhard Wagner lauds in his speech as the law that will protect German blood, the Nuremberg Laws. Marriage between Germans and Jews is outlawed. In 1936, Wagner discusses with other high-ranking party men and doctors the possibility of making a film. At the film's premiere in Berlin, 1937, Dr. Wagner gives the welcoming speech. The film will be shown in every cinema in Germany. Alles Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. Erdgesunde Menschen wohnten in engen, lichtlosen Gassen und halb verfallenen Lauben. Idioten und Schwachsinnigen baute man aber Paläste und diese kranken Menschen waren gar nicht empfänglich für die Schönheit, mit der man sie umgab. Das deutsche Volk kennt das ganze Ausmaß dieses Elends wohl kaum. Es kennt nicht den drückenden Geist jener Häuser, in denen tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. In den letzten 70 Jahren hat sich unser Volk um 50 Prozent vermehrt, während die Zahl der Erbkranken im gleichen Zeitraum um 450 Prozent gestiegen ist. Wenn diese Entwicklung so weiterliefe, würde schon in 50 Jahren auf vier gesunde Menschen ein Erbkranker kommen. Ein endloser Zug des Grauens würde in die Nation hineinmarschieren, maßloses Elend über ein wertvolles Volk kommen, das dann mit Riesenschritten seinem Ende entgegenginge. Das Gesetz zur Verhütung erbkranken... Beautification of the world was one of the tenets of Nazi ideology. Once long ago the world was beautiful, but race mixing and degeneration had polluted it. Only a return to earlier ideals could make mankind flourish again. On July 18, 1937, the House of German Art and the Great German Art Exhibit are unveiled. It is a showing of the new genuine German art. Sculptor is given great precedence. Sculptors such as Brecker and Thorak launched the style that is to be typical of the Nazi era.
But Hitler's inauguration speech is not about art alone. This exhibit represents the end of lunacy in art and the denial of the German people's culture. Henceforth, we shall wage a relentless purgative war against the rear guard of our culture's disintegration. A flyer comes with a catalog. To put the renaissance of German art into proper perspective, the exhibition Degenerate Art is open the next day. With Goebbels' help, Hitler had already made sure of the exhibition's success. The Degenerate Art Show would put an end to Jewish art Bolshevism. The works of some 730 banned artists were shown. Oscar Kokoschka, Emil Nolde, Franz Mark, Max Beckmann, Jankel Adler, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. German art had now undergone its purifying bath. But Nazism's ambition to beautify included every area of life. It even found administrative expression in the Bureau of Beauty of Labor. We had us to gewöhnt dass unsere Arbeitsstätten, die Fabriken und Berghöfe hässlich und schmutzig aussehen. Das wird nun anders. Unsere Arbeitsstätten sollen schön und würdig werden. Es geht hier nicht um Äußerlichkeiten. Der Betriebsführer muss erkennen, dass noch wichtiger als die Maschinen die Menschen in seinem Betriebe sind. Es geht um ein neues, starkes Lebensgefühl. Es geht um die Freude an der Arbeit für den schaffenden deutschen Menschen. Cleanliness was the gospel of beauty of labor. Clean workers in tidy workshops was its slogan. Beauty of labor meant liberation of the workers through cleanliness. Chief physician Gerhard Wagner expressed it simply. If class struggle is to die out, work and with it creativity must first be freed from the stigma of dirt. <laughs> Thus, if one shows the worker how to wash properly, thereby raising him to a bourgeois level, he will soon realize that he has nothing to fight for. The worker's aesthetic awakening would not only free him from his class, but free society from the abrasive conflicts caused by class struggle. The society would be the embodiment of an ideal, cleansed from all ugliness, untouched by chaos and filth. It's people, handsome and healthy, striving for a common goal. Seit die nationalsozialistische Bewegung nach langjährigem Kampf endlich mit der Führung des Reiches betraut wurde, sind noch nicht sechs Jahre vergangen. In his inaugural speech, Hitler notes something of special importance to it. The acquisition of the classical Greek statue, the discus thrower, by Miron. Die beste Darstellung des Diskuswerfers, die jahrzehntelang in römischem Privatbesitz den Augen der Öffentlichkeit verborgen war, ist jetzt in deutschem Kunstbesitz. 
Hitler lets this event cap his speech as he says, let us perceive how splendid man's physical beauty once was and how we may only speak of progress when we have not only achieved in the Third Reich to state art of the highest rank. Sculptors like Arno Brecker and Joseph Thorak were not only artists, they were creators of a new type of man. It was their task to convey an image of the goal envisioned. To attain it, the Nazis would soon resort to more concrete measures. And it is Hitler himself who sets the process in motion. In 1938, he becomes active in a case that attracts his attention. The case of a child born blind who lacks one leg and part of an arm. Hitler orders his personal physician, Karl Brandt, to intervene. The child, whose name is Knauer, is said to be an idiot. Brandt, in Hitler's name, will tell the child's doctor to perform euthanasia, that is, to kill the child. Brandt was also to inform them that any judicial measures taken against them would be, through Hitler's fiat, null and void. Later, Brandt was told to implement euthanasia in all similar cases. Euthanasia means helping someone who is suffering to die. In the context of Nazi racial policy, the term would find a new meaning. On September 1st, 1939, Germany attacks Poland. The Second World War has begun. Nine days before, Germany signed a non-aggression pact with the USSR. Two weeks after war's outbreak, Hitler inspects a virtually vanquished Poland. A few weeks later, Hitler orders the start of the euthanasia program. Germany is to be cleansed of its failed human specimens. Hitler's friend and personal physician, Karl Brandt, and his chief of staff, Philip Buhler, are empowered to choose physicians for the program. The order is written out on Hitler's personal stationery and backdated to the day when war broke out. The tactic indicates doubts on Hitler's part. Even in the Knauer case, he had ordered that his role be kept secret. Now he hoped that the program would be more acceptable, if it could be linked with the war's outbreak. Murder of the inferiors would thus appear to be a mobilization measure. In Germany, psychiatry's ambition to preserve the body of the folk. Murder would soon be the most important form of therapy. The future laboratory for this form of therapy the test field for extermination was already in German hands. Poland, which had been crushed in less than a month. After extensive tests at Brandenburg Prison, Hitler, on the advice of SS doctor Werner Heyd, recommends the lethal use of carbon monoxide. An office is opened in Berlin for the program. Its address, Tiergartenstrasse 4, provides the organization's code name, T4. A system using questionnaires and doctor's reports takes form. 
The forms are distributed to hospitals and asylums. For each patient, details regarding pathology, work capacity, race, religion, and criminal record must be filled in. A space is reserved for the physician's decision. A blue minus sign means life. A red plus sign, death. From the beginning, Jews have a special status. For them, the diagnosis that they are Jews is enough. Later, the screened out patients are fetched. SS personnel in white coats attend to their transport. The bus windows are painted over to prevent people from seeing in. After a temporary layover, the patients are transported to the death facility. During this time, their families receive three letters. The first one states that the patient has been moved on account of the war. Then a second letter confirms that the patient has arrived safely. A doctor has signed it with a faked signature. The last letter prepared by a special department is a letter of condolence stating a fictitious cause of death. The signature on it is faked. At the death facility, the patients are gassed in small groups. The corpses are burnt in the facility's crematorium. In the T4 program, the Nazis' medical vision had found its vehicle of practice. That the T4 doctors falsified signatures and behaved like criminals does not mean that they doubted their own convictions. No, they worried that the German people might not be ready to understand their actions. The killings could have been done by any butcher. But if medical legitimacy was to be maintained, a doctor would have to open the gas taps. As great as the energy expended now in rooting out unworthy lives is the energy devoted to the preservation of valuable Aryan blood. German medical care was among the finest in the world with ultra-modern methods of treatment in many areas. This double role the physician healing with one hand and killing with the other, gradually began to sow mist far from Germany in the cellars of the victors. Portraits of the Nazi hierarchy come to light decades later. Alongside Gauleiter and party functionaries, we find doctors, genocide experts, and architects. Defining Nazism in traditional political terms is difficult, mainly because its dynamic was fueled by something quite different from what we usually call politics. This driving force was, to a great degree, aesthetic. Its ambition was to beautify the world through violence. 